You're listening to the weekly Parsha podcast with Ari Goldwag, recorded with Hashem's never-ending assistance in Ramah Pei Shemesh Israel, 5782-2022. This week in Chutz Lartz, the Parsha's Parsha's Korach, and in Eretz Yisrael, it's Parsha's Chukas. And before we get into the Parsha, before we get into an amazing idea connecting the two Parshas, a very deep idea about Aaron HaKoyen, I'd like to just mention to you something which I mention once a year. We're coming into Parsha's Balak and Pinchas, and... Baruch Hashem, I started this podcast 15 years ago, Parshas Pinchas. So Parshas Bolak is the completion of 15 years of the Parsha podcast every single week. And so, as I did in the past, I'd like to remind you all that this Parsha podcast is able to continue because of the support of people like you, the listeners, the people who are watching it. I encourage you to go to arigoldweg.com, click on the donate button, which is on the left side of the screen, and give what you can. Specifically, I don't know if you you noticed, but you may have that the quality of the video over the past two weeks had dropped. Now we're back because my camera had an issue. This is a Baruch Hashem, a very nice camera, an expensive camera, and there was uh, something broke in the camera, and it was about six hundred dollars. And we ended up doing other things with the upgrade. It ended up being about a thousand dollars to take care of the camera. The camera, of course is part of the Divrei Torah, to give over the Divrei Torah where the clear video is important, I believe, clear sound, that's why we're in a studio, that's why we're recording with studio quality. So I encourage you to go over to arigoldwag.com and click the donate button on the left side of the screen and uh, indeed help make these podcasts continue. Now let's get into the Parsha and I would like to share with you a thought very deep thought, comparing how Aaron is seen, Aaron HaKoyen, in Parshas Korach, and how Aaron HaKoyen, it seems from the beginning of Parshas Chukas, in regards to the Parah Aduma, there's a very interesting idea in regards to Aaron HaKoyen that we'll see in the Ramban together. But let's start off in Parshas Korach. In Parshas Korach, so, we have the challenge. Korach comes with his challenge to Aaron HaKoyen. Korach says, why is Aaron HaKoyen being singled out? for specialness, why is he the, the high priest, why are all of the Levium, why aren't all of us, why aren't we all special, why are some more special than others, why are any Jews more special than other, than other Jews, comes Dustin and Aviram, they ask that question, and the Torah goes out of its way, the story, the way that it's described, the events that took place, HaKadosh Baruch who proves unequivocally to the Jewish people that Aaron is special because he's special. He has a special status. It's, hum- it's his humility, perhaps. It's his nevua, his prophecy, his special abilities, whatever the idea is, whatever the reason is. But it's his uniqueness that qualifies him to be the Kayin Gal, to be the high priest. And one of the ways that the, the, the Torah proves, or that Hashem proves it, is through a particular test. Each of the tribes gives their mata, gives their walking stick, so to speak. We'll see soon that the mata is much more than just a walking stick. Each of them gives a stick, a mata, and it's left in the mikdash, it's left in the tabernacle overnight, and in the morning, they come and they see that there's something special about the mata, the walking stick of Aaron HaKoyen. It has sprouted, it has burst forth with flowers, with almonds, with, with life. And it represents the fact that Aaron HaKoyen is uniquely attached to the source of life, which is Hashem, which is God, and therefore he is uniquely suited to be the high priest and to act on behalf of the Jewish people in their service of Hashem. Now, there's some very interesting things, because over here we see that the entire theme of the parish of Korach is the uniqueness and specialness of Aaron and how he is chosen to be the one who will serve in the Mikdash, in the holy place, in the service of Hashem, in the tabernacle. At the beginning of Parshas Chukas, however, very interestingly, and it's something that you could miss if you didn't see the Ramban, and I don't, I don't remember ever seeing this idea before, but I was studying this together with my son Moshe Dov this week, and we saw together an amazing thing, and that is that when it comes to the Paraduma, the, the concept, the main concept at the beginning of Parshas Chukas is that if a person becomes Tamimes, they become impure, as we all are today, because we don't have uh, 
a special red heifer, the ashes of the red heifer, in order to purify ourselves. If a person becomes impure, so they have to go through a whole process in order to purify themselves with the ashes of the red heifer. Now, where, where is this Avodah done? In contradistinction to most of the, 99% of the Avodahs of the Mishkan, the Korbanas, the sacrifices, were brought inside of the Mikdash, inside of the tabernacle, inside of the, later in the Beis HaMikdash, in the temple. The Para Aduma, the acts, the Tahalich, the, the parts of the Avodah that were done, it was all done outside of the Mikdash, it was done outside of the encampment. Perhaps representing the fact that a person who was impure he had to go out of the camp. A person who had come in contact with the dead had to leave the camp, had to go to a certain, you know, a certain, a certain place. But the avoidance of burning the red heifer and the sprinkling of the, of the ashes, the water and the ashes of the red heifer was done outside, if I'm not mistaken, outside of the camp. So it wasn't done in the mikdash. Now, that's one point that Ramban points out. We'll see soon what the ramifications of that are, Mizrat Hashem, with Hashem's help. Another point of it is that whereas, and listen to this because this is very important, whereas all of the other Avedas, all of the other times in the future, after the Torah was given, that the red heifer, the process was gone through, it was done specifically, according to one opinion, with a Kohen Gadol, the high priest, according to other opinions, it, was, it wasn't necessarily, but here it was specifically done not by Aaron HaKoyen. The high priest, Aaron, was not the one who did it, but rather his son Eliezer was the one who did it. Moshe and Aaron were the, were the Nevi'im, the prophets, who acted and told over the information to Eliezer, Aaron HaKoyen's son. Eliezer was going to be the high priest in the future, but he was not yet at this point. Eliezer was the one who did the burning, etc., all of the different parts of this particular Avedah, this service, and then it was prepared and ready. And interestingly, the, the ashes of the red heifer that Eliezer did lasted throughout the first temple period until Ezra came along and he was the first one afterwards, 920 years later approximately, who actually made another red heifer. So the question is, why when it comes to Paraduma? Does Aaron seem to be excluded? Whereas in Parshas Korach we saw the centrality and the importance of Aaron Akoyin in the Avodah Samishkon, in the Avoida, in the service in the tabernacle, when it comes to the Para Aduma, he was not included. So we're going to get into that shortly. We're going to get, we'll see the Ramban together. But before we do, I'd like to share with you the Medrash in regards to the Mate of Aaron, the special staff of Aaron, because there was something unique about it, and it was not just unique in regards to Aaron himself, but we'll see that this staff that ended up flowering and producing almonds, even though it was detached from the ground, there was something unique about it, and it wasn't just his staff. It was a staff from before, and it was a staff that would be used later. And it will be used soon as well. It says the Medrash like this. And we need to understand, of course, as we read this, what is the concept here? What is the depth of what the Medrash is saying? What is the idea behind it? Mata Aaron. So, Moshe Rabbeinu was to take the staff of Aaron and bring it indeed into the Mikdash, into the tabernacle, along with the other staves of the other leaders of the tribes, of all the other 11 tribes. Yesh Hu Hamata Yehuda. There are those who say that this very staff was the staff that Yehuda had. Yehuda, what staff did Yehuda have? Shenemar, Umatcha Asher Biyadecha. There was a staff that Yehuda used, interestingly, when he came to Tamar. He ended up having a child in a very unusual way, let us say. But he had a staff, and he used that staff as collateral before he paid Tamar for her services. They ended up having a child together, actually twins, right? And we know that from that union came, eventually, David Amela. King David came from that union, Al Yad Ish Ben Parsi. Peretz and Zerach were the two children born from that union, but he used his staff, and indeed, she she disappeared. And then, when it came time, she became pregnant, and everyone thought that it was through an illicit, it was through some kind of inappropriate marriage, some kind of inappropriate union. And she brought out that staff. She brought out the staff, and she said she didn't want to say to whom it belonged, 
But she said, to whom this belongs is the one to whom I became, with whom I became pregnant. And Yehuda recognized that it was his own fault that she had been waiting, that there's a concept of leveret marriage, etc. I'm not going to get into that whole story. But there was a staff there. And that staff was the same staff of Aaron Akain. Very interesting. What does that staff have to do with our staff? What does that story have to do with our story? What is the concept? We need to understand the connection. But the Medrash nevertheless says that that staff was the staff of Aaron that proved Aaron to be the chosen one. Somehow that staff was connected to Yehuda in the story of Tamar. There are those who say that the staff of Aaron was the same staff as the staff that Moshe Rabbeinu used, that Moses used, in order to perform the miracles. When he performed the miracles, all of the the Saramakis, the ten plagues, were done with a staff. This is the same staff as Moshe, the same staff as the staff of Aaron. In this case, it's called the staff of Aaron because it served on behalf of Aaron to perform this miracle. But it was, we could say, the staff of the tribe of Levi, according to this opinion. Somehow it was also the staff of Yehuda. We need to understand that. There's a section here in the Medrash which part of it is important to us and part of it uh, I need to skip because it's not central to my point. But it says over here in the Medrash that in regards to this staff, the Gozer HaKadosh Baruch Hu Alamakal V'nimsa Olav Shema Mephor Shehoya Batzitz. Somehow there's a connection to the tzitz. The tzitz was a special um, head plate that went on the forehead of the Kohen Gadol, the high priest. And it said on a Kodesh Lashem, Holy unto God. It had a certain function. It created a certain level of atonement for the Jewish people for certain issues. Toma and Tahara. But it uses the word in regards to the mate of Arna Koin. It uses the words Vayoytse Perach. It produced fruits. This, this, the staff of Arna produced fruits. Vayoytse Tzitz. It, it blossomed. It had blossoms on it. Very interesting. Also at almonds, as we mentioned. But what is the concept of Vayotze Tzitz? So it's also connected to the Tzitz of the Kohen God, which had on it the name of Hashem. So to the staff of Aaron, in a miraculous way, the name of Hashem appeared on it, and that's what helped it perhaps to produce this unbelievable mir- miracle that it came to life, even though it was a, it was a walking stick. What is the idea of Ayatzei Tzitz? It's a very important idea. The Marzu connects it to another place where we have the letter Tzadi and Tzadi. The word Tzitz is made up of, of the letters Tzadi, Yud, Tzadi. So you have the letter Tzadi twice. Where else do we have the letter Tzadi twice? Manzpach, we find that there are five letters of the Torah. Mem, Nun, Tzadi, Pe, and Chaf. These five letters have a double letter. You have a letter in the middle of the word, and we have a different version of that letter at the end of the word. And the Medrash earlier, actually in this parsha, two sections earlier in Chaf Aleph, we have this concept of the end letters which represent the end times. The, the Geula, a Geula, a redemption time. Moshe Rabbeinu says, Pakoid Pakarati, uses the double pay. Right? You have a pay and you have a pay sofis, or an end of pay. You have the letter pay and you have the letter pay at the end of a word. There's a concept of the end, a doubling. Pakoid Pakarati is the secret um, code word that he used, Moshe Rabbeinu, when he came to tell the Jewish people that he was coming to redeem them. And there's a tzadi and a tzadi. The tzadi and the tzadi, the Marzu tells us, has to do with the final geula. There's an ish tzemach. Yeah, ish tzemach tatzmiach. There's a tzadi and a tzadi in regards to, who we, to, to whom we refer when we say, as tzemach dovet avdecham ehir tzatzmiach, we ask God to bring us the offshoot, the growth, the one who's going to grow out of King David. So the tzadi and the tzadi represents somehow the geula, represents the redemption, the final, the final redemption which we're looking forward to, Bezrat Hashem, which will be soon, perhaps sooner than we even know. The staff somehow is connected to the Mashiach, to the Messiah, as we're going to see even more soon. But there's a miraculous thing that happens with this staff. What is the concept of this staff? Vaisei Amata says the Medrash in finishing off that very same staff was in the hands of each and every king 
Each and every king of the Jewish people used that staff somehow. We need to understand what that means. But they used the staff for some purpose. What's the purpose? We'll see very soon. Until the temple was destroyed, and then the mate, the staff, this very staff, which Yehuda used, which Moshe used for the miracles, which Aaron Akain used to prove his, his specialness, each of the kings used it. But when the Beis Hamikdash, the first temple, it seems, was destroyed, so it was hidden away. That very same staff is going to be in the hands of the King, Mashiach, the Messiah, the Redeemer of the Jewish people, Shenemar. As the verse says, it's a verse in Psalms, The staff of your power, Hashem, you will send from Zion. Zion is another word for Yushalayim, Jerusalem, which is the seat of God's glory. Go out and strike in the midst of your enemies. So this verse tells us that in the future, Mashiach is going to have the staff, and it also tells us what is the purpose of the staff. The purpose is to strike the enemies of the Jewish people. So, let's now go back a moment, because now that we have this concept, and we still need to, of course, understand the depth of it, but the purpose of the staff, the same staff of Yehuda, of of Aaron, of Moshe, of the kings, of Mashiach, the purpose of the staff is to strike the enemies of the Jewish people. Now, what does that mean? And in this, it's important to point out, which I didn't read it inside, but the Medrash also mentions that the staff would strike the enemies of Levi, of the Levites, because some came to say that Aaron HaKoyin was not the chosen one. Korach came to say that. And somehow this staff proves and strikes out against those who deny the specialness of Levi, it proves that they are wrong, it proves that Aaron is special and unique. And again, I want to remind you of the question that we said earlier, which has to do with Parshas Chukas. Why is it that when it comes to Parshas Chukas and the Paraduma, Aaron is excluded? Whereas over here we see that he's specifically chosen when it comes to the Mikdash, the tabernacle. We're going to come back to that question again. I just wanted to remind you guys of it. But let's look for a moment at what the staff does. Because it's very essential to understand the uniqueness of Aaron, the uniqueness of the Jewish people themselves, and what Mashiach comes to do, what the Messiah comes to accomplish, and what every one of the kings of the Jewish people came to accomplish. And that is as follows. The Mata, the staff that we are speaking about here, it strikes the enemies of the Jewish people but what it really comes to do is to prove and to show to us who is the tzaddik it's the tzitz it's the tzaddi and the tzaddi well, who is the tzaddik who is the righteous one because the nations of the world lay claim to chosenness right just as Korach came to say that hey why is Aaron chosen the nations of the world also say hey we took over the chosenness of the Jewish people the Jewish people they were chosen for a while, perhaps, but they lost their chosen status. They sinned. God, they lost favor. Famous thing, Achashverosh made such a claim, but Christianity makes this claim. Islam makes this claim. The Jewish people were rejected by God. Now, the very fact that we exist, we are for sure back in Eretz Israel, Bezrat Hashem, with God's help, seven million strong back in the land of Israel, it's kind of a little kasha. It's a little. Uh, question upon their assumption but part of what Mashiach comes to do is to show the truth to show the truth of the tzidkus the righteousness of the Jewish people throughout the years despite the fact that we may have strayed from God's ways we, we, we were even punished because of it we lost the temple but Mashiach will come to show with this mata with this very staff it's the staff which proves who is special, who is chosen by Hashem, who is the soul of the world, who is the, to be the leaders of the world, the spiritual leaders of the world, to show the entire world what it really looks like to serve God. What is the proper balance between chesed and gvur, the proper balance between love, right? the Christian idea is a tremendous amount of love sometimes it wasn't expressed that way throughout history but a tremendous amount of love the the idea of islam is 
His din, his judgment, God is going to judge you if you don't do exactly what you're supposed to do. And the Jewish people gives the proper balance between these two ideas and proves and shows that God is a God of love. But he's also, the, the way that he interacts with us is tempered by justice. We have both ideas. God is going to be one and His name will be one. We have Hashem, we have Yud Kevavke, which is Rachmim, and we have Elokeinu, which is Din. We have the mercy and we have the judgment. Somehow, God interacts with us with both. And that's the balance that the Jewish people uniquely represent and will teach the world. But there's, before that, before we get to that moment, there's a, a mata. There's a, there's a, Staff, and if you think about a staff, it's really the same staff that you know spare the rod and spoil the child, right? Western civilization has completely spared the rod, defund the police, right? Spare the rod and spoil the child. The incredible amount of of licentiousness, of lack of order, lack of commitment to to spirituality, lack of commitment to common decency. That represents Western values. And then you have the opposite extreme, which is the Islamic world, which is too much din, too much anger and, and judgment. And the Jewish people here in the center with the balance. But the purpose of this staff, which is the staff which comes to strike when used in the proper balance, it's coming to prove who is special. It proves that that same... That same Staff is what proves that the Jewish people are unique because it, when Moshe uses it through the plagues, we see that that same plague it appeared to the Egyptians as something which destroyed them. And for the Jewish people, it was something which brought them out of Egypt and separated them from amongst the nations of the world. In the context of Aaron Akayan, that staff proved that he was special and he was the one who belonged inside of the Mikdash, the tabernacle despite all of, the, all of the detractors who said that he wasn't special, he wasn't unique, it proved that he is the one who belongs there. It's his humility, it's his special nature, it's his ayev shalom, v'roidev shalom, his running after peace, his love of peace. Each of the kings was able to use it as well, in their particular context, to be able to prove that the Jewish people is unique and special, really, as King Solomon did indeed rule the world, as, as our sages tell us. The Jewish people are supposed to rule the, rule the world with this staff, which proves that we have the balance. And ultimately, Melech HaMashiach, the king, the Mashiach who's going to come and lead the Jewish people properly, is going to prove to the world that we as well are special and we have that balance. And it's going to bring upon the world a certain level of judgment which will prove that we are special as opposed to all of the other nations of the world and we are to be the leaders of the world. That is the staff. Now looking back very interestingly on Yehuda. There is also an aspect of proving the specialness and the correctness, right? As Yehuda says, Tzad kamimeni. Tamar seems to have done something incredibly wrong. She became hara luznunim. She became pregnant by going out and doing something licentious. But she proves with the staff, the staff proves that she had done the right thing. She had performed a leveret type of relationship in order to have children from the correct line and she gave birth. She proved her righteousness. Sad kamimeni. There was a righteousness which was proved through the mata, through the staff. Now let's look, and we'll see that when it comes to Aaron Akayan, there's a reason why he's not able to to be involved in the para aduma, in the red heifer, and it's connected very much to this concept of separation. And it doesn't look like I have the time to explain it completely fully, but I'll at least touch on it. We'll try to understand. The Ramban tells us, I can't read it inside, there's not enough time. The Ramban tell, tells us that the Pura Adum, as we mentioned, was specifically done outside of the encampment. All of the ritual, all of the parts of the Avoida, of the service, were done outside of the encampment. And perhaps you could explain, for this reason, Aaron Akoin is not able to do it. The, the Ramban also says that Eliezer was the one who did it. One of the reasons that he says is because Aaron Akoyin, he had a stain on him. He had on him the stain of the Eagle Hazav. He was involved in the sin of the Golden Calf. So he was not able to do it. Now it's very interesting because the sin of the Golden Calf didn't stop him from being involved in all of the other types 
of a void of service in the, in the Mikdash, in the tabernacle. When it came to something which was outside of the encampment, there was a different aspect there. He couldn't do it. He couldn't be involved in it. It had to be Eliezer HaKon, who was untainted, his son, who was untainted by the sin. He was going to be the future Kohen Gadol, but he was untainted of the sin of the golden calf. Now what is the idea? Perhaps you could say that the idea is like this. That when it comes to the Mikdash itself, when it comes to the Temple itself, so we are in the inner aspect, in the inner sanctum, and it can't be touched by sin. When you go out into the outer worlds, when you go out into, let's say, we could compare it to the difference between Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, performing the commandments here. There's a specialness of doing it here, as opposed to those who are doing it outside of Eretz Yisrael. There's a much greater danger outside of the land of Israel when it comes to being judged, when it comes to judgment. There's a greater danger outside of the camp, outside of the Mikdash, when it comes to judgment. As I said, I can't get so far into it, but Aaron Akoin inside of the Mikdash, it's just, we're looking at his essence of who he is, of his specialness. And the sin that he did doesn't touch it, doesn't, doesn't cause any damage to his uniqueness and his specialness. Inside of the Mikdash, inside of Eretz Yisrael, there's a different way that a Kodesh Baruch Hu looks at us. There's a different type of judgment. It's different. Outside of Eretz Yisrael, outside of the Mikdash, we can be tainted by sin and we can be called to task on our sins in a different way, heaven forbid, because of the fact that we're outside of the Mikdash. Aaron Akayim, when it comes to Parshas Korach, so it's talking about the, the centrality of the Avoida, of his service inside. When it comes to the Parah Aduma, which has to do with death, with, which has to do with the sin of Adam HaRishon, which has to do with the Egel Azov, which has to do with the, the sin of the golden calf, which brought about death into, into the world, and has to do with the outer aspects. So there has to be a deeper level in order to be saved from judgment there, there has to be a deeper level of purity and it can't be tainted. A person who's been tainted, we don't, we don't see, right? It's hard to see when we look outside of Israel. It's a great example. You look outside of Israel, it seems more like the Jewish people are not as chosen. They're not as special. The, the nations of the world have power outside of the land of Israel. You can have a scholar movement. You can have an enlightenment movement. You can have people who've lost their connection to Yiddishkeit. But in Eretz Yisrael, it's very different. Look at, the, look at the land of Israel, look at the tshuva movement, the, those who are returning to Judaism within the land of Israel. It's much stronger, more powerful within Israel. So, you, know, you look at the, the, even the people who are far away from Yiddishkeit within the land of Israel, they're still more connected to Yiddishkeit. They're still more connected to Judaism and to observance and to, and to traditional observance. There's something special about Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel. It's like it parallels the Mikdash where there's a different type of connection and outside of Israel parallels the, the different type of connection and the loss of connection and the judgment I can't get so far into it our time is up but I'd like to bless you and ask you to bless me that Hashem should help us to recognize the amazing importance of being inside of the Mikdash of being inside of Eretz Yisrael of living in the land of Israel the centrality of it the way that HaKadosh Baruch Hu looks at us differently here Hashem should help us to recognize the importance and the holiness of Eretz Yisrael. Hashem should inspire within our hearts the desire to be in the Mikdash, to be in the, in the center, in that place where all we see is the purity and the chosenness and the specialness. Hashem should help us as He has brought back so many to Eretz Yisrael, to the land of Israel, back into the tabernacle, back into the holiness, back into the place of spirituality. HaKadosh Baruch Hu should help us, draw us back into this place and bring Mashiach, bring the Messiah. Hashem should show and prove to the entire world so soon the specialness, the uniqueness of the Jewish people and of the tribe of Levi and of Mashiach himself speedily and in our days. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you again next time. Have a good Shabbos. This podcast was made possible through the gracious donations of listeners like you. For more podcasts like this, please visit www.arigoldwag.com or search on iTunes, Ari Goldwag.